Hey, Mr. Alred, and we're continuing talking about radicals and roots, but now we're moving into what is known as imaginary numbers. And that sounds weird if you've never heard of it, but if you remember when we talked about the definition of the square root, we said that the square root of a negative number is not a real number. And since we said it's not a real number, something we'd put on our normal number line, like we could measure or um, our bank account could record as a positive or negative or a distance from here to there, we call that imaginary. And the definition of the imaginary number is that the square root of negative 1, we will just call I for imaginary. So this is a definition, so it's not something you can really question. You can think about it, um, but when we say something is through definition, there's not really a discussion about whether or not it's true. It's something that we've created to kind of move forward. Okay. So from there, what we can say is if we accept that the square root of negative 1 is something we'll call I, um, we can come down here to these two examples I have, and we can say, well, what is the square root of negative 25? Well, I can use my properties of um, radicals and real numbers to separate this. So I can say that 25 is, excuse me, negative 25 is 25 times negative 1. So I can have that under the square root, and then I can remember that if I have two things multiplied together under the square root, I can separate those into two separate roots. So I can call square root of negative 25. Um, we can rewrite that as square root of 25 times the square root of negative 1. So square root of 25 is 5, and by definition we've said the square root of negative 1 is i. So this i should not be under a square root, but we would write that as 5i. Okay. The second one here, we, uh, which is square root of negative 7, we would say the same thing. We could change that to square root of 7 times negative 1. We could separate those. 7 does not have a nice square root, so we'd have to leave it as the square root of 7. But we can write that negative 1 outside as an i. So <clears throat> we never leave the negative under the square root. Okay, so that's part of our simplification problem, properties. We never leave a negative under a square root. Okay? Um, we always pull it out and write it as i. So the fact that we said the square root of negative 1 is i means we can take any negative under a root and separate it. Okay, let's uh, see some more properties here. So based off of what we just said, <clears throat> Uh, we can make a couple of statements here. We can say that um, i to the 0 is 1. Well, anything to the 0 power is considered 1, right? Uh, that's the definition. Um, i to the 1st, well, anything to the 1st is itself. So i to the 1st is i. And that's still that square root of negative 1, um, but we don't like writing it as square root of negative 1. Okay? We like taking it away and making sure it's clear that it's an imaginary. Well, I squared. Well, I squared would be the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. And if you squared that, it would knock out the square root, and it would be negative 1. This is um, kind of separate from the properties of real numbers because we can't just multiply the negative 1 and negative 1 together under there. It kind of defeats the purpose. Okay, But I squared will always reduced down to negative 1. So it turns into a real number. I cubed is, um, well, let me erase that. I cubed would simply be I times I squared. And we just said I squared was negative 1, so that's where we can get this negative I. And then i to the fourth, well, i to the fourth would be i squared times i squared, which is negative 1 times negative 1, so that would be a positive 1. And now that we're at 1, if we said i to the fifth, it would kind of cycle, because i to the fifth would be i to the fourth times i. 
And then i to the 6 would be i to the 4th times i squared, but i to the 4th is always 1. So if we keep going up into higher powers, we end up seeing that we can reduce it down to any of these things here on the right-hand side. So any power of i can be reduced to remove the i. That would be if we had an even power like the square or the fourth power, c, that's 1 and negative 1. Or leave an exponent of 1. That would be the i to the first or the negative i to the first. And we can do that by um, dividing the exponent by 4 and using the remainder. So let's see what I mean by that. So here's some examples. We'll start off with i to the 19th. Well, i to the 19th is a bunch of i to the 4. So we can say how many 4s are in 19? Well, there's 4. And 4 times 4 is 16, so there's a remainder of 3. Okay, so this is going to be our new exponent. So i to the 19th is i to the 4th times 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 i cubed. All those i to the 4ths are 1, and i cubed is negative i. So we don't have um, an exponent greater than 1 there. Um, i to the 7th times i to the 9th. Well, remember, I'm going to add the exponents since they're like bases, and that would be i to the 16. And I just saw that 4 goes into 16 four times, and it doesn't have a remainder. So let me clean that up a little bit. I'm a little sloppy today. So that would be i to the 0, or just 1. So i to the 7th times i to the 9th is a fancy 1. Not your favorite version, though. Um, i to the 12th over i to the 6th, well, we're dividing bases, so we can subtract exponents. So 12 minus 6 would be i to the 6th. Um, if you said 4 into 6, you would say it goes one time with a remainder of 2. So i to the 6 is the same thing as i squared, which is negative 1. So while we say we have these powers of i, we can reduce them. Okay, very quickly here. The next thing we're going to talk about is complex numbers. Um, a complex number is a number that contains both a real and an imaginary part. And these can be written as a plus bi, where a is the real part and b is the imaginary part. So my example here. <coughs> 7 plus 4i, where 7 is the a, and that's the real part. And then 4 is the b, and that is the imaginary part. So the real and imaginary part together make a complex number. So it's complicated because it's both real and imaginary at the same time. And it's important to realize that because of that i, on the imaginary part, which is causing it to be imaginary, um, it's very different. It has that square root of negative 1, so it can't be combined with the 7. So you can't add these two together. They're not like terms. So let's see if we can write some things as that a plus bi. Okay. So here I have 12 minus the square root of negative 81. So I'm going to rewrite that as 12 minus, and I've got a negative, excuse me, square root of negative 81. So I can rewrite that. The square root of 81 is 9, and because of the negative, it would have an i. So it would look like 12 minus 9i. 12 is the a, and negative 9 is the b. Now here's a place. Um, the next example, I've got two... Um, complex numbers, and they're subtracted. The first complex number is 2 plus the square root of negative 9, and I'm going to subtract the complex number 6 plus 5i. So first of all, I'm going to rewrite that. 2 plus the square root of negative 9 could be 2 plus 3i, because the square root of 9 is 3, and the negative comes out as the i. It doesn't change the sign in front there. And then it'll be minus... 6 plus 5i. Now, while the real and the imaginary 
parts are not like terms, there is an imaginary part in both of these and a real part in both of these. Um, so I can distribute that negative and make some nice things happen. I will have 2 minus 6 if I talk about the real part, and I'll have plus 3 minus 5i. So cleaning that up, it would be negative 4 minus 2i, and that would be a real and an imaginary part to give me a complex. The last one here is a foil, okay? So um, it's two uh, complex numbers multiplied together. Um, the first one is 3 minus 7i, and the second one is 4 plus 5i. So since it's kind of like two binomials, we're going to foil it and get all four parts. So 3 times 4 from the first is 12. Um, we can multiply different types of terms. So the outer 3 times 5i is plus 15i. The inner, negative 7i times 4 is negative 28i. And then the last, negative 7i times positive 5i would be negative 35i squared. So I'm going to do a couple things here. Um, oop, I forgot to write my square. Um, the thing I need to do here is look at the i squared. And remember that i squared is negative 1. So I'm going to bring this down as negative 35 times negative 1. I'm going to bring down the 12. And I'm going to combine the 15 and i and negative 28i. That will be negative 13i. But since this will be 12 plus 35, I can add some of that together. So my final answer will be a real part of 47i from adding 12 and the positive 35 that I'll get at the end, and it'll be minus 13i. Okay, So I can treat the i and interact it with other i's like a variable or like terms, um, but I can always reduce any power on i down to a power of 1 or even eliminate it if, um, if it's an even power.